الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهدي الله فلا مضل له وما يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد والله إله إلا الله وحده وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد we begin by praising Allah عز وجل the supreme the sublime the unequaled we begin by praising your creator and my creator and the one who created everything that ever existed but is himself uncreated. We begin in the name of Allah, the most merciful generally, the most merciful specifically. Uh, and we bear witness that there is no deity, no deity whatsoever worthy of worship except Allah and indeed the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is his last our most noble messenger and is indeed an example for the whole of mankind. So well, the topic for today inshallah is uh, Islam, uh, Islamic finance and the economic system and I actually want to take a little bit more generally and talk about our relationship with wealth, our relationship as Muslims with wealth. Uh, before I do that I just want to kind of introduce myself um, so my name is Omar Suleiman. Um, I, I worked in the city for a number of years, I think between 15-16 years now. Uh, I started off my career as an accountant, I used to work for Ernst & Young. Um, but for the last, I think, around 14 years or so, uh, I've been working in Islamic finance outside of my job uh, in various roles. Um, I work, I'm, on, I'm on the board of uh, the Islamic Finance Council. So this is a not-for-profit body who have been lobbying the government. So for example, now I'll talk about Islamic mortgages later. I'm sure some people want to ask questions about that. And there was this issue about double stamp duty. Okay, uh, so we lobbied the government to have that removed. Uh, I was engaging with the government to have uh, student loans, have a Sharia compliant version of the student loans. Uh, so I've been working with them on that. And more recently, working with the UN around uh, sustainable development goals and aligning them to Islamic finance. Outside of uh, the IFC, uh, I also work with the Islamic Council of Europe, which is a Sharia body uh, based out of East London Masjid at the moment, headed by Sheikh Haytham Al Haddad, Hafizullah. Um, and they do qada, they do Islamic rulings, they provide guidance to the community. Uh, so I sit with them and we look at Islamic finance contracts. I look at them and advise them from a commercial perspective. So uh, there's various mashaykh there, it's not just Sheikh Haytham, alhamdulillah, there's a number of other mashaykh under them, uh, Sheikh Sajid Umar, for example, Sheikh Fahad Abdul, um, Sheikh Faraz Farhat, Sheikh Farid Haybatan, Sheikh Shukur, Rahman. So there's a number of different scholars and they will look at different issues individually and then collectively. And the reason I'm saying that is because it's important when we look at any, kind, any type of ruling, it's that there's kind of some sort of peer review. Um, so I work very closely with the Islamic Council of Europe, especially on all of their financial issues and business transactions. Mm -hmm. As well as this, uh, I sit, I now head the board for Wahid Invest, which is a global Islamic investments uh, company. They were started in the US a, a couple of years ago, three years ago, and they basically give Islamic investment opportunities, access to Islamic investments for the average Muslim. Alhamdulillah, they're in the US, the UK, uh, they're in Malaysia, they'll be going into Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, mm -hmm. India, Pakistan, Alhamdulillah, you know, for, for a number of different regions. Um, I also advised Yielders, which is the first Sharia compliant FCA regulated fintech, uh, and they, do, they allow you to invest in property. Okay, so in this complete Sharia compliant, I advised them uh, around their governance and how to be Sharia compliant, and I worked with uh, Sheikh Abu Isa Ni'matullah for their certification. Okay, um, and, and I guess finally the last thing is that um, one of the main programs I used to run with the IFC was to train Sharia scholars in conventional finance. Okay, and this is, this is quite an important point because a lot of the scholars, they understand the fiqh, but the application of the fiqh is where there were some challenges. Because the financial system today, and I say this, is very, very corrupt. The financial system that we all interact with and that we all uh, are involved in in some way or shape or form is absolutely corrupt and it's unjust. 
okay and even though you have Islamic banks that engage with scholars they still behave duplicitously okay they don't behave in a straightforward way and they take advantage of some of the scholars and, and it, you see this I've seen it on the inside how it works and so we ran a program globally training scholars in conventional finance so we would take the scholars and go through how do banks actually work what's the role of treasury what's the role of the audit function how are bonds structured what happens when you leave your money in a current account I don't know if you guys know this but when you put your money in a bank you're actually lending the bank your money and they actually make money from your money right what's the difference between putting a current account and a savings account and these are all things uh, that we should know so we were training scholars globally on that so this is an introduction and the reason I'm saying this is so then you can temper yourselves in terms of questions that you ask me uh, I'm not a scholar by any shape size or form but I work very closely with the scholars so if there's something which you need a specific fatwa for you can contact ICE Islamic Council of Europe but I can tell you where there's general areas around car financing home financing the different views that are out there again okay, around insurance from my discussions with the scholars and I'll try and uh, educate everyone on that so before I go into the detail let's take a step back let's look at Allah uh, in the Quran when he talks about wealth and Allah talks about wealth and it's subhanallah the, the, the longest ayah in the Quran is actually to do with riba the longest ayah in the Quran in Surah Baqarah is to do with riba okay so that just tells you something uh, straight away but actually if you look at Surah Baqarah and Surah Baqarah is about rules it's talking about the Bani Israel etc but there's a lot of verses in Surah Baqarah around charity and many of us should make ourselves familiar with this now as Ramadan is coming on this is typically a time where people become more charitable uh, and just for time I'll go through some of them for example Allah says uh, ayah 43 be steadfast in prayer practice regular charity and bow down your heads with those who bow down in worship then Allah also says worship none but Allah treat with kindness your parents and kindred and orphans and those in need speak fair to the people be steadfast in prayer and practice regular charity and this is uh, ayah 83 then ayah 110 be steadfast in prayer and regular in charity whatever good you send forward for your souls before you you shall find it with Allah Azza wa for Allah sees well all that you do that's ayah 110 but then ayah 215 they ask you what they should spend in charity say whatever you spend that is good is for parents and kindred relatives and orphans and those in want and way for wayfarers and whatever you do that is good Allah knows it well this is ayah 215 these are spread out throughout Surah Baqarah then you see subhanallah from verse 261 onwards from 261 all the way to 274 this is a block of ayahs on charity Allah says from those who spend their wealth in God's cause, those who give their money are like grains of corn that produce seven heirs, each bearing a hundred grains. God gives multiple increase to whoever He wishes. He is limitless and all knowing. So, this is amazing. I just want everyone to one moment think about this. Allah says, starts this whole block of verses from 261 to 274 the ayahs in a block are all to do with charity and Allah starts it with the person who gives his money in charity what's his return so one grain of corn that produces seven heirs and each heir bearing a hundred grains that's 700 times so for every one pound that you give in charity Inshallah, it's at least 700 pounds worth of reward. 700. Everyone's going to talk about investments, right? Maybe we'll cover this later in the Q&A. And people will say, oh, I can get 10%, 20%. This is amazing reward. This is amazing return. Where does 7,000% or 70,000% compare? Because Allah, Allah is the one who's giving that return. Allah is, need. Allah is free from need. Okay? This is what Allah gives us when we enter into a transaction with Him. 
And then Allah tells us in verse 274. So this was the first verse of the block, and then the last verse is Alladina Yunfikuna Amwalahum Bilaili wa Nahari Sirrawn wa Alaniya. Falahum Ajruhum Rinda Rabbihim Wala Hofun Alayhim Wala Hum Yahzanun. Those who give out of their own possessions by night and by day, in private and in public, will have their reward with Allah Azza wa Jal. No fear for them, for them, nor will they grieve. Those who give by night and by day from what they own, what's theirs? Not borrowed money, not possessions which have been purchased on credit, not possessions which they've taken from someone else. From their own possessions by night and by day, in private and in public. Okay? And I'm going to say on this point, MashaAllah, we as a community are amazing at giving charity in public. You know, I think had it not been for COVID, I think we would still be having lots of lavish charity dinners. This is a reality of, a, as, of us as a community, and I think I really want to hit this point home. Our relationship with charity needs to change. We have made our charity transactional as well, in that sense that we only give when we're given something in return. We only give when we're given something in return. I've seen it. I work in the city, subhanAllah, and I speak to people and they say, okay, we're only going to give if we're invited to a dinner first. Or there's this entertainer that comes. Or we fly in a superstar shake, you know. And then we do all of these things, and then we give charity. Compare this to the companions around the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Compare this to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For how many weeks and nights he had no food in his house? And everything he'd have, he'd give it. He'd give it. The companions, when they were asked, they'd give. Okay? So these ayah, Allah talks about sadaqah, 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 charity, charity, charity. And I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Because these are the verses that precede the verses of riba. So Allah when He starts talking about wealth, He goes, let me set your mind straight first. Because everyone wants to talk about making money. This is a time that we live in. It's all about instant cash. You can make money straight away, have a passive income, be a uh, work at home entrepreneur, millionaire. Everybody wants fast money now. Allah before he goes into that, he's setting the scene. Who are the people who are going to be successful? Who are the people that will have reward from Allah? Those who give in charity. So he's setting us to get ourselves ready for the verses of riba. That we hold money in our hands and not our hearts. Because this is another misunderstanding. That people think Islam is not about making money. No, its intention isn't to make money. But Islam doesn't call for you to be poor either. Of the Ashra Mubashra, the ten Sahaba who were promised paradise, five of them were billionaires by today's standard. Just consider this. Five of them were billionaires by today's standard with real asset, gold and silver. But why were they given paradise? Because they would give. They would give. They held the money in their hands and not their hearts. So Allah is telling us, earn money. And you'll see it, the verses, I went through these verses again. Each of the verses, to look at them, how Allah was he telling us in each verse. And Allah is telling us, look, from 274, then it's verse 275 is about riba. Okay? Then verse 276 is about riba and charity. Then verse 277 is about charity. Then verse 278 is about riba. Verse 279 is about riba. Verse 280 is about charity. So Allah is saying, warning about riba. And then he talks about giving good, giving charity. Then he warns about riba. And then he talks about charity. Verse 281 is a warning. And then Allah is telling verse 282, which is the, light, the longest ayah, he talks about the rules of a contract. That when we make a contract with each other, you should have witnesses and so on. This is the longest ayah. That's the rules then. Only then do we get the rules. First Allah has said, be generous. Then stay away from the haram. Be generous, stay away from haram. Be generous, we stay away from haram. 
So you can understand the type of person, how they should be. Then you go into the rules. Then you get into the rules. Then verse 283 is the rules of the contract. Then verse 284 is about accountability. And then verse 285, subhanAllah, is about believing in Allah Azza wa And it contains the famous statement of the Sahaba, subhanAllah, that they used to say, why they were the chosen and the most successful people. Because when they were asked to do something, what would they say? Sami'na wa ata'na. We hear and we obey. Which is probably the complete polar opposite to us today. When we hear something, we say, but is there a ruling that allows us to do it? Is there a way around it? What about this opinion? But do we have to? I'm just saying, compare it. Compare this to the Bani Israel. When Allah asked them, who the surah is named after, to sacrifice a cow, what was their response? When the Bani Israel were asked to sacrifice a cow, what was their response? Maybe someone can tell me. Where Go on. Where will we find the cow? Where will we find the cow? Where will we find it? What else did they ask? The color of the skin. The color of the skin of the cow. What kind of animal? How old is <laughs> The age of the cow. What type? SubhanAllah. Allah just wanted them to sacrifice a cow. But they were finding all of these excuses. You know, like, what type? This, that, and the other. Compared to the companions, subhanAllah, when they were asked to do something, سَمِعْنَا وَعَطَانَا We hear and we obey. Okay? The reason I'm saying all of this is, let's look what Allah wants from us. He's told us to be charitable, to avoid riba, and then at the end of the day, you'll be put in situations that maybe we can't understand, and we have to obey Allah. Okay? So I'm, I'm setting the scene like this, just before I go into the rules so we understand what should be the psychology of a Muslim when it comes to wealth. We should understand the psychology of a Muslim, what Allah wants from us when it comes to wealth. As for riba, as for riba, let me ask everyone here, is riba haram? How do you define riba? Interest? So is all forms of interest riba? No. No? Okay. We'll come to that, mashallah. And is, if something is not called interest, can it be riba? Yes. Yes. Okay, good, mashallah. So look, riba itself, uh, we would, as a general definition, say it's any any loan that brings a benefit. Any loan that brings a benefit. Right, so hold that thought. What is it? What's the definition of riba? As a general definition, what do we say? Any loan that brings a benefit. Okay, good. Right? Even though most people understand the prohibition of riba, I want to go through some of one ayah and some of the ahadith about riba, just to remind us. Because we live in a time where we've become completely relaxed about it. This is the reality of it. We've become so engaged in it, we don't even see it as something wrong anymore. Allah tells us, But those who take riba will rise up on the day of resurrection like someone tormented by shaitan's touch. That is because they say, قَالُوا إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ riba. That trade is like riba. Jazakallah. Trade is like riba. But Allah Azza wa Jal بَيْعَ وَحَرَّمَ riba. But Allah has allowed trade. أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ بَيْعَ Allah has allowed trade but He has forbidden riba. And Allah said the person who engages with it will be like someone who is tormented by shaitan's touch. This is the ayah. If we look at the hadith from Jabir related to the Prophet وسلم, wrote, May cursed, cursed be the receiver and the payer of interest, the one who records it, so today will be the lawyers, and the two witnesses to the transaction, and said they are all alike in guilt. 
From Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, On the night of ascension, when the Prophet went for the Miraj, and I think some people, this was recently when it occurred, according to the Islamic calendar, on the night of ascension, I came upon people whose stomachs were like houses with snakes visible from the outside. So you can imagine the stomach and the snakes are inside and you can see them pushing against the skin. Okay? And I asked Jibreel who they were. He replied that they were people who had received interest. They were people who had received interest. And this was scary because it didn't say they are people who had charged interest. People who had received interest. And we'll cover bank accounts uh, later, inshallah. Because at some point, almost all of us, if you have a bank account, would have received interest. Okay. Then from Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu said, There will certainly come a time for mankind when everyone will take riba, and if he does not do so, its dust will reach him. I think definitely without a shadow of a doubt, this is a time that we're living in. I used to audit companies. I used to audit companies. Big companies, mashallah, that were hugely profitable. But despite this, they would still take loans and they would still function on interest. Today, any transaction you do is touched by interest. This is the system that we're in, okay? But that doesn't mean that you don't try to keep yourself free from it. And then from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, the Prophet said, God would be justified in not allowing four person, four types of people to enter Jannah. Four types of people to not enter Jannah. Or to taste its blessings. The person who drinks alcohol habitually, he who usurps an orphan's property without right, the one who is undutiful to his parents, and the one who takes riba. Now all of these are hadith. Then the one which is probably the most scary. Because if you think about all of the different sins which are mentioned, name me one sin, whether it be adultery, whether it be gambling, whether it be drinking alcohol, whether it be killing someone, in which it's said to you, Prepare for war with Allah and His Messenger. Prepare for war with Allah and His Messenger. This is the one who deals in riba. They are at war with Allah and His Messenger. And the problem is, you see, for many of us, we can't see the ills of riba. We live in a time, and the reality is, my dear brothers and sisters, living in the West, we are the net beneficiaries of riba. As a whole, globally, we're the net beneficiaries of riba. When someone's drunk, you can see it upon them. When someone is violent, you can see what it's like, the, the impact it has. When someone who gambles as well, you can see what it's like. But riba, who really sees the damage that it's done? But I can tell you firsthand, firsthand, and this is just one example, and I often give this when I'm giving talks on Islamic finance. I was doing an, uh, a, a job at Deutsche Bank when I just finished university. I was doing an admin role, looking and taking care of some of the documentation. And I had paperwork, right, paperwork that I was looking at, and this was from 1979. 1979. <coughs> Deutsche Bank, which was one investment bank, it had lent... Bangladesh and Nigeria, one million pounds. Bangladesh and Nigeria, Deutsche Bank lent it one million pounds. Okay? And I was looking at this paperwork in 2005. And in 2005, both countries had paid back in excess of 25 million pounds and they still hadn't paid back the loan. They still hadn't paid back the loan. 25 million. And this is, look, one bank, just one loan. You imagine all the other banks, then the World Bank, then the IMF, International Monetary Fund, then the other countries, 
that lend money to the developing world just so that they can take their money out. In banks, and I know this, right, because I used to work in one, they have a special department which does economic research. And what this department does is look at all of the countries and work out its net surplus, i.e. what it produces, what it sells, what it has, its net surplus in terms of how much excessive wealth it has. The equivalent would be to look at us and our expenditure and see how much savings we have at the end of the month. They work out each country's net surplus and then they work out how they can get that net surplus out of those countries. So riba is destroying the developing world because these countries can't get out of the prison in which they're in. They can't get out of it because they can't pay back 25 million for 1 million and you still haven't paid it back? This is crazy. Then you look at France and Africa. France which colonized Africa, they've taken all of their wealth out. They won't let the African nations control their own wealth. They say, listen, you can't manage it properly. We'll manage it for you. So you have to keep the money in French, the French capital markets. When you need money, you need to get it approved by France. And then the France will give them loans. This is their wealth. And this is how they're controlling them. And this is why I say that the financial system is so corrupt. Forget, even if you put to side riba being haram. If you put that to one side, the way they do business is completely unethical. They go in, they will change the regimes. Woodrow Wilson, who was an American president, he said back in, like I think in the 1700s, he said, banks are worse than standing armies. Banks are worse than standing armies. You look at what's going on in the world today, the fights are all over trade, okay? So I'm laboring this point for everyone to understand. Riba is fundamentally unjust. And it's not just Islam that says this. If you look in Deuteronomy, it says it in the Bible. The Jewish tradition, it says it. They then changed it, obviously, to say that you can't have... You, oh, riba is only forbidden. Interest is only forbidden amongst themselves, but you can charge it to other people. Okay? Gentiles. But as a concept, it was forbidden amongst each other. Thomas Aquinas, who was a French philosopher, he said, interest is fundamentally unjust because you're selling nothing for something. You're selling nothing for something. Okay? So it's seen as something completely unjust. It takes away real productivity, real commerce, and all it does is the people who have money make more money. Okay? So, this is our introduction to riba. Now I want to talk about some of the rules. Okay? Now, some of the main rules around Islamic finance is number one, there should be no riba in the contract. No riba in the contract. There should be no... And it's not just interest. This is the point I was saying this. That Islamically, something is known by its reality, not by what it's called. Okay? Something is known by its reality, not by what it's called. So there could be something which, is, which isn't called interest, but it's still riba. And there could be something which is called interest, but it's not riba. And I'll give some examples of these, inshallah. At the end of it. So, there should be no riba in the contract. No riba in the contract. And how did we define riba? Interest. Interest. What else would we say? A loan that makes a benefit. A loan that brings a benefit. Okay. So, let me give you some of... Let me, let's, let's do a bit of examples. Should we do some examples about if something is riba or not? Yeah? yeah? Alright. Uh, what's your name, brother? Saeed. Saeed, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, Saeed. Saeed, if I give you a hundred pounds and I say to you, can you give me back a hundred and ten pounds? Is that riba? Yes. 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 Yeah? Yeah, okay. Yeah. If I give you a hundred pounds and I say, 
I want you to give me back a hundred pounds and give me this can of Coca-Cola as well. Is that riba? Yes. yes. Why? Because you get the benefits of it. Sah, because I get a benefit of it. What if I say to you, say, I'm going to give you a hundred pounds and you give me back a hundred pounds. And when you give me back a hundred pounds, you gave me ten pounds extra. Is that riba? On my own, I decide to give you ten pounds. Yeah. What do you guys think? No. No riba? Is riba? Yeah. Why, uh, okay. Yeah. Why is it not riba? Um, I just realized it's riba, but it's it's not interest. It's riba, but it's not interest. Would you? Everyone else? The contract of agreement. Ah, this is important. This situation isn't riba. It's not riba. Why? Because when I gave him the money, I only asked for the same amount back. It was a kart hasana. If from his own volition that I did not know about, he wants to give something extra as a gift, that's completely down to him. The issue is when contractually, contractually, you try to get more money for yourself. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimullah, he used to refuse to walk in the shade of a house of someone he'd lent money to. Think about that. He would refuse to walk in the shade of a house someone he would lend money to because he saw it as a benefit that he took. In the modern context, if you've lent someone money and they own a, say for example, they own a restaurant. So you've lent them some money. So you turn up and you say, all right then, you know, and he knows that you've lent him money so he gives you free food. You see how easy it is perhaps to fall into this. Or you turn up expecting cups of coffee if he has a coffee shop because you've lent him money. It's very subtle. But this is how easy it is to fall into riba if you're not careful. Okay? Now, riba is clearly prohibited. And the way we would understand it in terms of modern transactions, if you ever see anything which says capital protection, have you heard this term, capital protection? What it means is that if you do any sort of investment, they say you're guaranteed to get the money that you put in back. Anything that guarantees your money back and some form of profit, consider it riba. Yeah? The qualities of an investment are risk and reward. You could lose the money and you could gain. The qualities of a loan are that you give the money and you're guaranteed contractually that that person has to give you the money back. Yeah? Okay? Jay. So no riba. Then Allah also tells us that avoid what's known as maysir, gambling. Gambling. Okay? Allah tells us the ayah in the Quran is that they ask you, O Muhammad, concerning wine and gambling. Say, in them is great sin and some profit for men. But the sin is greater than the profit. Thus does Allah make clear to you his signs in order that you may consider. Also Allah says, O you who believe, intoxicants and gambling, dedication of stones and divination by arrows are an abomination of shaitan's handiwork. Eschew, leave alone such abomination that you may prosper. And then also, Shaitan's plan is to excite enmity and hatred between you with intoxicants and gambling and stop you from the remembrance of Allah and from prayer. Will you not then abstain? So gambling, clearly prohibited. But even imagine this, SubhanAllah says in the Quran, that there may be some benefit because you can say on an individual level, a person may gamble and they may win. How do you say this person hasn't profited? Well, I'm saying no. Interacting with it on a whole, this is something which is prohibited. It's wrong. It's unjust. You cannot win without somebody else losing. In gambling, you cannot win without somebody else losing. You see the difference with bay, with trade. In trade, no one loses, inshallah. You exchange. You have a product, you exchange it for money. 
For your money, you get some good or service. Gambling, the only one who can win is at the expense of other people losing. Okay? So gambling today, also speculation. When you don't know what you're doing and you're hopeful of an outcome, is gambling. When there's some chance involved, is gambling. Now, I'll say this point actually, this is quite important. This area of Islamic sciences, so finance, comes under mu'amalat. Have you guys heard the term mu'amalat? Yeah. You've heard mu'amalat say, mashallah. Anyone else, have you heard of mu'amalat? Mu'amalat, and the other branch you could say is ibadat. Ibadat, ibadah, and mu'amalat. Does anyone know what the difference is? Or how you define the two? Go on. It's one worship. Ibadah is worship. Ibadah is worship indeed, but mu'amalat can be worship indirectly. Ibadah, to do an act of worship, you have to have clear evidence. Yeah? So when we pray salah, you can't do salah how you want. You know, you can't stand on one leg if you want. This is forbidden. You can't pray five rakah when we pray four rakah. It's very strictly defined. Yeah, you need evidence to do it. Mu'amala, amazing subhanAllah, is everything is permissible unless it's specifically forbidden. So Islam doesn't tell you that you have to wear these type of tracksuits or you have to wear this type of jacket or you have to read this type of book or the book has to be a hardback and not a kindle this is all mu'amala and this is very easy and actually Allah has made it easy especially in trade everything is permissible other than those things which are impermissible and these are a few which is what? no riba no gambling then something called gharar which is uncertain excessive uncertainty where you don't know the reality of what you're buying and the person can't define what they're selling so the classical examples where somebody says to someone I'll sell you the fishing rights to the fish in this bit of sea okay so the person he doesn't know how many fish he's going to get so he may spend all that money time and effort and he gets nothing out of it and the scholars have been discussing gharar, they said actually, you know, what the intent of the sharia, one of the intents of the sharia, is that nobody leaves the transaction feeling hard done by. It always talks about uniting the hearts, yeah, that no one should feel unjust by. Because look, imagine that a person goes in and he spends all day trying to fish and he gets nothing and he spent money. How could the person guarantee he doesn't even know what fish are in there? So these type of transactions, gharar, an unnatural amount of risk is forbidden. Okay, so no riba, no gambling, no gharar. And then the other qualities, okay, there should be a product or service that the transaction crosses over. It's not a money for money transaction. So I give you a bottle of water, you give me a pound for it. It should be clear that the one who's purchasing something knows exactly what he's purchasing and the one who's selling it knows what he's selling and the price should be agreed this sounds quite straightforward doesn't it if I say to you here's a bottle of water yeah you know what it is that when you look at the financial markets today and I say to you I'm going to sell you a bitcoin who can tell me what I've sold them Is it an online currency? Can, can I see it? Can I print it? What is it? It's just a bunch of numbers, maybe? Yeah. I'm just giving it as an example. If you buy a future or some sort of options or a derivative, and I'm saying some of these terms, just maybe for the people at home who's watching, uh, what are you buying? You're buying the option for a movement in stock price. or the option to purchase something at a later date okay Islamically this is something else that was um, prohibited which is called double deferment but I don't want to get too technical this is when 
you delay the buying of something and the taking of it, both of them are delayed at a later date. And contractually, you try and tie it together. You can't do this. Um, Jay, okay, let me, let's go through it quickly then. So, no riba, no gambling, no gharar. You need to know what you're selling and the person needs to know what they're buying. The transaction needs to be free from ghish. You need to be very clear, transparent. You can't, you know, induce someone to buy something they shouldn't buy. The person needs to be very clear in all of these things. And once you understand this, inshallah, this is the main body of investments. Okay. I'm just mindful of the time. How much time do we have? Normally 15 minutes, but if you go a little bit over, we can delay ourselves. 15 minutes, okay. Shall I jump into some questions, I think? Maybe some questions, maybe you guys want, and then I can add any bits I want afterwards. I think it may be better. Are there any specific questions everyone, anyone has? For example, a a pot of water. We buy it for 20 centimeters and buy it for one pound. It is a river or not? No. So, the no, bottle of water, you're buying it for 20p? 20, 20, 20 something. And we buy it triple or four, or four, or four times his price. Okay, but this is trade. This is bait, this is trade. Some scholars said that you shouldn't, you couldn't have it multiple times, more than a certain number of times, but generally, this is trade. The person who's gone out, he's gone to the supplier, or he's got the water, he's bottled it, he pays for his workers to put it together, he pays for the plastic, all of this, and then he applies a margin. There's a real trade going on, and you don't have to accept it. If I sell this in the market for one pound, there's no compulsion. No compulsion. If you want to buy, you can buy if you don't. It becomes an issue when the commodity is restricted and there's a public need for it. Yeah? So at times of famine, the Islam tells you to you can't have a monopoly. That you can't own or restrict something which the public needs. So water, for example. You can't restrict water then or overcharge on it. Then the state has to get involved. But generally in an open market, in a free market, yeah, you can... Somebody else wants to sell it for 50p, let them sell it for 50p. As long as they're selling something which is halal. And this is another point. Uh, this is such a big point actually. The underlying thing that you sell in a transaction has to be halal. Yeah? So this means that you can't, obviously, alcohol, haram, meat, pork, these type of things and other types of industries, you can't sell, you know. You can't sell something haram in a halal way. Yeah? You can't sell something haram in a halal way. So, Haji and Sons, off-license, these type of things. Yeah? SubhanAllah, I heard about this the other day. There's this one shop, not far from where I am. SubhanAllah. It's an off-license, and they also do halal meat. Off-license and halal meat, you know? SubhanAllah. May Allah Azawajal purify all of our wealth. Okay. So, does that help, brother? Yes, yes. JazakAllah. Investment in the share market. Yes, so investing in shares. Okay, so uh, with shares, there's certain criteria you've got to have. Okay, now, um, IOFI, I bought these books, so I think people know. IOFI is the Accounting, Auditing, and Governance Standards for Islamic Financial Institutions. This is made up of global scholars. I'll hold it up for everyone you know, they can see. These are global scholars that they come together and look at different rulings when it comes to finance. And they've set a number of criteria. Generally, this is a good starting point for looking at if you can invest in something or not. And they apply certain criteria. Number one, that the underlying company, the company has to be dealing in something halal. So something like Apple, it sells computers, laptops, etc., phones. This is a halal product. Yeah? Something like Budweiser. Can we invest in it? No. No, good. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Just checking, yeah? All right. Okay, so they say that has to be a criteria. Another criteria is how much debt the company has. If the company has more than 33% debt, you can't invest in it. Because they're saying actually, the company, the majority or a significant amount of it is debt, and there's an uncertainty about whether it can meet its transactions, number one. And the other thing is that actually you're no longer trading in a 
company which has assets but you're trading in debt. So it becomes a money for money transaction. The other criteria they apply is that income from impermissible activities can't be more than 5%. Now this 5% threshold that they set is the scholars on based on Qiyas. They came together, they said for example, um, so Apple, argument's sake, Apple, multi-billion dollar company, but they put their money in a conventional bank account. That money will have interest which they include in their income. As long as that is less than 5%, you can still invest in the company. However, you work out what percentage it is, and from your dividends, from the money you earn, you have to give that percentage in charity. Yeah? It's called purification. You have to give it in charity. It would be ideal if there was no uh, impure income, but the reality is, and this is why the hadith of the prophets are so, so true, that everyone will be covered in the dust of riba. There is, you, you can't, for example, Tesco, percentage of it is from alcohol, etc. And you need to work out what percentage is from impure income. Yeah? And so this is, there's a filter that's applied to these companies. Then they look at if they've borrowed money, etc. What activities are doing, all of these type of things. And that screen. So when I said, for example, I said I'm on the board of Wahid. Wahid, they have a, they've got a, a, a dual layer of Sharia checks. They have the Sharia Review Bureau, who then, there's a scholarly board, who will look at all of their transactions after they've already applied IOFI principles, and they will choose the stocks and shares that you can invest in, and then you can choose to invest in them. Yeah, They've done the hard work to try and find all of the stocks, they do the calculations on the ratios, and then they let you know. Okay. Uh, about the percentage that you were discussing, yeah. five and six, uh, I had discussion that what is the proof some scholars say, like, how do they come to this conclusion? Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so this is why I said it's Qiyas. Okay. It's Qiyas, it's based on looking at what's a small amount uh, and what to do with it. So the 33% is based actually on inheritance. Because when the Prophet ﷺ was asked about, when a person asked him how much they can give in charity from their will, the Prophet said just a third. And that is a significant amount. Hadith of the Prophet says that that is a significant amount. So one third you can give and that's considered a significant amount. And so Qiyas, that was applied. The 5% is the scholars and there's a number of different scholars from different mavahib, from different backgrounds, different nationalities that come together to do it. Okay, and they, they came up with that 5%. Any other questions? Assalamu <coughs> This question uh, about riba, there's no doubt riba is haram. By all means, nasus exists in the Sharia. Yes. About the commodities, gold and silver. Yes. In current time, we are dealing with currency, with paper money. Yeah. Right. For example, I lent money to somebody, 10,000 pounds, and he bought a house. Yeah. Right. After 20 years, he is returning me 10,000 pounds yeah. while his house is gone more than 10,000, 50,000 worth after 10 years. Yeah. So now 10,000 pounds which I gave him, it depreciated, depreciated yeah. as, as your inflation, yeah. uh, inflation everything. Yeah. My 10,000 is almost next to the thing. So how the scholars of economics, they will justify that if I'm lending money to somebody for 10 years, and after 10 years, his house is worth 50,000. But my 10,000 is worth maybe in gone, maybe something to 90% is gone. Yeah, yeah, possibly. But you see. Not possible, it's the exact thing. What happens if uh, there is uh, a, a credit crunch and the house price is dropping value? Yeah. Will you ask him to pay you back less? No, no, my question is what would you do with the depreciation of the money? It's, uh, it's one example. Yes. But this is the point you see, you're looking at it from a point of the asset appreciating. If you want to get into a business transaction, then you share the risk and reward. Rather than lending the money, invest with it. Invest. This is, this is the point of trade. But if you want to guarantee your money back, if you want to guarantee your money back, then you're lending the money. Now, the issue of deflation, okay, what you can do is maybe give him the equivalent of gold and silver. Yeah, this, this, is the, this is the thing which the scholars are missing when they're explaining these things to set a criteria 
that if you are lending money or you are borrowing money, set a criteria of gold or silver or commodity. For example, I am giving you today 10 gram gold. Yes. When you are returning me, you are returning me not 10,000, you are returning me 10 gram gold. It values 20,000 pounds or 30,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds. Yeah. But this criteria is missing among the scholars and the economists. That no, I, I think... Um, Dubai is haram, there's no doubt, but these, there are questions which the scholars, Islamic scholars, are not able to satisfy the public when the, the, the money is deflating every month or every year. Yeah, so this is an issue. Inflation, okay, is a problem of the riba-based system. You have inflation because when they start playing with the interest rates. Now, the one thing that you missed in this transaction is that when you lend someone the money, how much reward do you get? Does anyone know? It's, it's more twice the charity or whatever the hadiths are. The, the, the reward is 50%, half of what you lend is considered sadaqah. Two times. Yeah, so... Two times. Oh, there's two times? Yeah. Two times. Well, no, there's two rewards. One is you get your money back, and the other one is that it's half of it is considered a charity. So there's two times in that sense, but not twice the money that you gave, okay? Now consider this, if you're lending somebody money because they have a need, Allah will inshallah remove a hardship from you on the day of judgment. For someone to borrow money and they're in need, okay, and they've come to you, you imagine that person what state they're in. Nobody likes to be in that state. Imagine someone's forced themselves to come to you and then how will you be? How will you be with them with regards to that money? This is why the rules are there, agree a time when you pay it back, etc. But you have to do it. A qarb should always be for reward from Allah. It should never be for profit. Now what you're saying, I understand, is that you don't want to be disadvantaged by doing it as well. And so uh, Dr. Imran Uthmani, the son of Mufti Taki Uthmani, Mufti Taki Uthmani is probably, I guess, one of the foremost scholars in Islamic finance, a senior Hanafi jurist. His son said, look, what you can do is when you give the money, like you said, this is equivalent of 1 kg of gold. And when you return the money, give me the equivalent of 1 kg of gold. I spoke to some other scholars and they said, look, rather than even do that, what's better is that you buy the gold and give it to them. You buy the gold and give them the gold and then they can come and give you back the amount of gold. Okay? To avoid this. But we have to accept that, look, we're going to be charitable. We want to be charitable in how we do these things. We do it to try and help each other and there's huge rewards for this. And this is why Allah talks about Sadaqa, 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 Sadaqa before Reba. No, no. In, in, in Islamic terms, when you give a loan, you don't lose on your loan. Yeah. You don't lose on your loan. Exactly. But in the currency, there is a problem that when you are giving loan as a currency, no doubt you give loan. All Muslims, they give loan with the intention of having reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one thing. Secondly, his loan is Decre decreasing every single day, decreasing as the currency is, is going down and down. For example, if you give a loan, five, ten years back I gave a loan to somebody 5,000 pounds. Yeah. And that became uh, a million, yeah, million uh, rupees. Sure. But now, to that is, uh, if, if you go into that same currency, so that 5,000 pounds is remained now 2,000 pounds. Yes, subhanAllah. May Allah bless you. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it is. It is. There are questions that the public is looking into. There's no doubt. There no, is, but no, this none is. None of the ulama they are making riba haram. No, no. The problem is, you see, it's that we live in a corrupt, and this is why I'm saying the entire system is diseased. The way you need to look at the economic system is this, brothers and sisters. Imagine somebody has an illness. Yeah. Someone's got heart problems. So the doctor's giving medicine that then causes an issue with his liver. So the way the interest system and inflation works is like this. They put down interest rates, inflation goes up. They try and push inflation down by putting interest rates up. Because the whole system is corrupt. They create money out of nothing. And this is a bigger task. And the scholars, I think they are starting to address this. You know? Um, I'll take one more question because of time. Uh, brother, home on, on ownership. Home ownership. Yeah, mashallah. Brother, because brothers had questioned, but I think I received an email that, that you're going to have 
an online uh, workshop about the homo. Oh, that religion. was done. We did that before. Oh, you're not going to do it again? Or? Possibly. Very quickly. Everyone, does anyone want to know the answer for home ownership? No. no. Yeah, everyone, mashallah, they've all got their own homes, no issues. Yes, you don't. The answer, okay, let me tell you the, the different views on home ownership. So, Islamically, there are the view a mortgage, a conventional mortgage that your high street bank lends you. Uh, when I've looked into it, I found two scholars who say it's halal as it is. There's one, Sheikh Atabek Shukurov and Darul Ifta from Egypt say that getting a house with a mortgage is permissible as it is. The vast majority of scholars say no, it's haram. Yeah? This is a very, very sharp opinion. What you also have though, is the European Fatwa Council who said, they got together and they said, if you're going to purchase a house for you to live in, just one for you to live in, then you are allowed to do it under the state of a darura or a haja, which is a need or a necessity. Okay? However, I guess this is probably the famous fatwa, everyone knows this, yeah? You can buy a house and live in it with a mortgage uh, if it's just the house that you reside in. Everyone knows the answer, but they don't know what the scholars said in that fatwa. They say that you have to go through a number of steps before you come to that. Have you exhausted every other angle of finding a place, finding a way to have a home to live in? Number one. Number two, they didn't say that it becomes halal for you. They didn't say it becomes halal for you. They say it's a necessity. The same way, if you were starving in the middle of a desert and the only drink you have is Carlsberg, Allah forgive us, then you can take it. Right? In that circumstance, it doesn't mean normally you can take it. And it doesn't mean that the alcohol, khamar, has become halal. It's still haram. Number three, if you understand that it's still haram, then you want to absolutely minimize what you take from it. People have understood this fatwa and they go and buy six, seven bedroom houses, double garages, big garden, go and buy in the nice part of town because they understood it to be halal. It's not. If you truly considered it haram, the person who's starving in the middle of the desert and all he has in front of him is some sort of pork. Does he eat all of it? No, he's only allowed to eat that amount to survive. The same with this ruling. Okay, so there's the European Fatwa Council. Then the other opinion is, example, Islamic banks that offer halal home purchasing. There are some scholars that sign off on it, but the scholars I speak to and we look at it, we don't agree with these. I'm going to be very open and say it. Because the way they're structured, they're no different to a mortgage. They protect their return on the money that you give them. We said that an investment is, risk and reward is shared. Where you have capital protection, it's a loan. Now, the problem with the Islamic finance industry today is that they've done lots of financial engineering and they've made every product mimic a conventional product by putting lots and lots of different contracts in. Okay? So, my view on this is that you... Avoid them as well because they are no different to a conventional mortgage. Okay, but you can speak to a specific scholar for a fatwa for your situation. Then comes what's the final option in terms of pure halal options for home purchasing. Now I've been looking at this for the last few years. There's a few different options. Okay, if you can't borrow the money to buy a house. Number one, there is a company that's set up called Primary Finance. Some good brothers, one of them is Sheikh Badr al Hassan, Primary Finance. They, are, I, I, they launched a couple of years ago, but I'm not sure if they're doing the home purchase yet. Their structure, we've looked at it at the Islamic Council of Europe, it's completely halal and it's just. Okay? Primary Finance, they do one. Another one has just come to market is Crowd to Live. There's a good brother, Alhamdulillah, he used to work in Qatar for a number of years. He's come here, he set up Crowd to Live, it's like a shared ownership option. It is quite expensive though. It's quite expensive, I'm just letting everyone know that. The same is with Halo Housing. H-E-Y-L-O. They do a shared ownership scheme. You put in, an example, a £100,000 house. You put in 20000 they put in 80000 you own 
they owe eighty percent. You pay rent on their eighty percent, okay? And then you staircase and buy more of their shares, but you don't have to. This is the difference between this and something that like around. You don't have to buy more shares, but it makes sense if you do so because the rent's going to go up every year, okay? So that's the other option. And then the final one is a pure shared ownership contract. So housing associations they do developments and they will allow you to buy um, homes and it's a shared ownership. You put in a percentage, they own a percentage, and then you rent their share off them. The challenges with shared ownership is they're not available in every area, and it's normally on new builds. But have a look for shared ownership. The structure is permissible. The structure of shared ownership is permissible. Okay? Um, I'll leave it there unless there's a pressing question just because of time. Um, normally we get car insurance, credit cards, these type of questions, I assume everyone's okay with that. And I just want to say this just as a closing few points, my dear brothers and sisters. You know, when it comes to our wealth, this is a thing that makes man anxious. We worry about where we're going to get money from. We chase money, we chase the dunya, you know, for some form of protection. But Allah has said, he's a razak Allah has said, he's a razak He's the one who provides everything that we ever need. The Prophet you know, I read this yesterday. When the Prophet died, he had a debt. And we know Islam tells us that we shouldn't have debts. Strongly discourages us. The Prophet refused to pray Janazah with somebody who had a debt. But the Prophet's debt wasn't like that. He had a debt to a Jewish person, but he left his armor as Rahan as collateral. Okay? He left his armor as collateral. And so that debt was covered. But do you know why he had a debt? Because he went to buy some grain for his family. Because they hadn't eaten in weeks. Our beloved Prophet who could have had the world at his fingertips, he borrowed money to feed his family. Today we live in a society that we borrow to feed our greed. Everything is done on borrowing to feed our greed. We buy into this system. This isn't how we should live. Allah <laughs> When we were in the wombs of our mothers, when we were in the wombs of our mothers, did we consider where our nourishment was coming from? The way we were dependent on that umbilical cord, today when we're on the earth, Allah continues to provide for us in the same way. But we have to have Iman in this. Allah provides for us. Allah says in the Quran by the Ausman of Shaitan Rajim, وَمَا مِن دَابَةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا عَلَى اللَّهِ رِزْقُهَا And there is no creature on the earth but that Allah provides its provision. And then Allah says, وَفِي السَّمَاءِ رِزْقُكُمْ وَمَا تُوْعَدُونَ And in the heaven, in the heaven is your provision and whatever you are promised. My dear brothers and sisters, Allah provides your risk, Allah will give to you. Don't try and seek your risk through impermissible activities because rather than it being something that nourishes you and blesses you, it will become something that causes you to eat hellfire in the hereafter. Wa akhiru ta'wana wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakallah.